Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Later on the show, we'll take you to St. Petersburg, where the Hermitage is playing host to the golden age of Dutch Renaissance art. Talk to a critic about this year's BAFTA nominees and visit Helsinki, where a festival is shining a light on the city's cold, dark nights. But first... Inspired by the culture of Anatolia, witness the evolution of artist Eren Eyvolu as she makes her way from 1930s Paris to 1980s Istanbul. She married into the culture, but embraced it as her own. Eren Eyvolu became a Turkish citizen after marrying Turkish painter Bedri Rahmi Eyvolu in 1936. But while many Turkish artists look to the West for inspiration, Eyvolu's artistry blossomed in Anatolia. Showcases Adil Halim visited Ankara's Jar Modern to see how Eyvolu's life was reflected in her art. She's one of the most important and influential figures in modern Turkish art. Ironic, considering she was born in Romania. But Erin Eyobolu proved to be a quick study. She's a lover of Anatolia and uh, she spent uh, around 60 years in Turkey and uh, until she died and uh, she produced to the very last minute uh, of her life. Um, she uh, actually uh, gained a lot of uh, fame during the first years of the Republic. Born in Romania, Eyubolu never considered Turkey a second home. But that all changed in 1936 when her and her husband moved there and spent their time traveling around the country and studying the Anatolian way of life. As a result of those journeys, the culture of Anatolia, its landscapes and people all became an inspiration for her work. She also met many influential Turkish artists soon after the establishment of the Fine Arts Academy in Istanbul. Eren Eyubolu's uh, approach in there it was a little uh, more important for us because uh, she had the chance to look at Anatolian folklore uh, with the universal glasses. And um, so that brought us actually uh, a lots of uh, different information from uh, her past in France and in Romania. Uh, where she comes from and where she studied uh, fine art. Her work focused on gypsies, aliens, and the movement of people, the latter being something she is very familiar with. She's credited with helping to bring European thinking and techniques to her adopted home in Turkey. She brought in uh, lots of new streams uh, to the other artists. Uh, once we see her a cubist, uh, as cubist, once we see her as abstract expressionist. Uh, on the other hand, we see her a totally, totally folkloric uh, design maker. And then, um, so until the 1985 uh, she died, uh, she produced uh, without interrupting uh, her productivity. Dear Modern's director says Eyubolu's arrival in Turkey helped open the doors for other artists to realize art is not limited to a certain city or country, and that world experiences can fuel artistic creativity. Adil Halim, TRT World, Ankara. Come on showcase who will take home this year's golden mask uh, good morning it's a real honor to be here with Haley to announce the nominations the nominations for... the favorite becomes the favorite with 12 nominations at this year's BAFTA Awards Rembrandt, Vermeer and Da Vinci. Under one roof for the first time, the Dutch Golden Age comes to Russia's Hermitage Museum. 
But before we bring you those stories, here are a few others making headlines. Organized by Turkey's public broadcaster TRT, the 11th annual International TRT Documentary Awards are open for submissions. And so far, more than 650 applications from 80 countries have been received. The winner of the international category will receive a prize of $11,500. Submissions for the awards close on January the 25th. After weeks of controversy and debate, this year's Academy Awards will reportedly take place without a featured host. According to a report in Variety magazine, multiple presenters are set to appear. Last December, the Academy announced that American comedian Kevin Hart would host this year's Oscars. But a few days later, public pressure forced Hart to step down after homophobic jokes from an earlier comedy routine made the rounds on social media. Disgraced Pixar co-founder and former Disney animation chief John Lasseter is the new head of animation at Skydance Media, producers of films like Mission Impossible Fallout and Star Trek Beyond. Lasseter was put on leave from Disney Pixar, who later cancelled his contract following multiple allegations of workplace misconduct. on the heels of the Golden Globes and less than a few weeks before the Academy Awards nominees are announced come the British equivalent to the Oscars. The British Academy of Film and Television Arts nominations are out and it's a female-powered film that's received the most nods. A royal comedy drama, The Favourite, is leading this year's nominations with 12 nods in categories including Best Film, Best Director and Costume Design. The film depicts Britain's 18th century Queen Anne as an insecure and easily influenced ruler. All three leading actresses, Olivia Colman, Rachel Wise and Emma Stone, are nominated. Also competing for best film are Freddie Mercury biopic Bohemian Rhapsody, space drama First Man, Alfonso Cuarón's Roma, and actor Bradley Cooper's directorial debut, A Star is Born. We'll have to wait until February the 10th to find out which one of those will take home the golden mask. But in the meantime, let's talk to arts editor Stefan Kriasis about his thoughts on this year's lineup. Hello, Stefan. Welcome to Showcase. Hello, thank you for having me. Hi. So a lot of critics seem very critical of this year's nomination for the best film and many of the nominations were panned, including Bohemian Rhapsody. What have you been hearing? <laughs> uh, there's been a massive split and which is happening increasingly between what the critics are loving and what the public is loving. And this has been reflected for years by best Oscar winners taking very small box offices. Um, and this year, Bohemian Rhapsody was really not liked at all by the critics, and it's taken, I think, over 740 million across the world. So it's a huge hit with the fans. My family. We believe in each other. That's everything. We're going to do great things. So there's a massive divide. Uh, the BAFTAs have only nominated Bohemian Rhapsody in Best British Film, Outstanding British Film, not Best Film. But it is certainly looking um, very hopeful for the Oscars as well. So it's, it's, it's throwing up a question of how much influence the critics really have anymore. How much influence do they have anymore then? Hmm. Um, I think they are important for highlighting films that people might not see. Obviously, you need people for guardians of the craft, for the technique, for the history of filmmaking. 
Um, and, but I also think sometimes critics miss the point of a film that is just pure entertainment or what a film's intention is. With Bohemian Rhapsody, there was criticism that it wasn't delving enough into the darker side of Freddie Mercury's life and death. But they very clearly said from the start that the film was a celebration of the music, the creation of the early music and the band. So it never had that intention. So I think that's where there's been a split um, between what the critics wanted the film to do and what the film actually set out to do. Mm -hmm. But why is there recently a discrepancy between what critics think and what the public thinks? Why do you think it's happening recently? More and more. I don't know that it's, it's just recent. It's not just recently. For example, the last 15 years of the Oscars, the best film is, I think, 15 years ago was The Return of the King was the only time it's been the, the highest grossing film of the year, was also the best Oscar winner. So there's, there's, never, there's always art versus commerce, popular entertainment versus highbrow. So this division has always existed. Um, I think the difference now is that people are able to um, post their own reviews, post their own views. You have numerous websites, numerous sites that are much more targeted towards specific tastes. So if you want a rock biopic or you want a gay film or you want Japanese anime or you want whatever it might be, you can, you can go and find out about the kind of films you want to see within that specific genre. And critics now are being left a little bit, they're a broad umbrella, but they're also not specifically talking to each area of fans. So I think there's now, there's just more choice and more ways that people can express their reactions and find out what people like them are thinking about the films that they want to see. Mm -hmm. So um, this year it was a, a bit more obvious though, wasn't it? Or is it just me? Uh, yes. Uh, I think this year, to be honest, there's just there's a lack of very strong films, and and this is possibly a slight problem. I mean, there, there's there's no clear front runner. There's lots of different films picking up awards in all different categories, but there's no big prestige films or sort of high craft, high art movies. So I think that's the issue, um, as much as the fact that the critics might be a little bit out of touch. There's very little for them to get behind as well. Um, and this is a growing situation in Hollywood with the making of increasing numbers of blockbusters. There's very little room anymore for the middle ground, um, which in a way is where the streaming platforms are coming in, like Netflix and Amazon and, and sites like this, because people are either making very small art house films um, for their own audience, which will just make back enough money, or Hollywood is just backing the big blockbusters. Those films in the middle where craft, art and popular entertainment meet are being made less and less. And this is possibly why there's less for the critics to actually get their teeth into. For example, Netflix production Roma was nominated yes. in BAFTAs and also yes. um, in other awards as well. What do you think this means for yes. the industry? Um, I, think, I think films being made is a good thing. I think money being given to Oscar winning filmmakers to make interesting, challenging, niche movies about minorities in different languages, about important situations. I think this can only be a good thing. Um, and critics are certainly responding to that. It's whether now the awards bodies and, and how you start rating these films. <laughs> Alfonso Cuaron was asked the same question backstage at the Golden Globes. Um, and and with the question was made with an air of slight disapproval that how dare he be there? And he's been facing this a lot at, at film festivals. Um, and his answer was, um, people are seeing my film and how many of the art house films that might also have been nominated have actually been seen and how long have their runs actually been in the cinema? Um, so Roma has had a few very limited showings in cinemas, but it's being seen by a lot more people. And for example, Bird Box, uh, which has just been a huge hit for Netflix, 
They very rarely release their figures, but it's been seen by over 26 million people in the US and I think over 40 million people worldwide so far. That's a huge audience. So if you can bring an audience to a film that they might not necessarily go and see, cinema prices are rising, it's expensive to go to the cinema. People might take a chance on a film that on a streaming platform they might not have thought about paying for. Mm -hmm. It can only be good for the industry, for the arts, for representation, for diversity, for risk taking. I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Well, Roma is my favorite, but what about your favorite? Mm. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I loved Bohemian Rhapsody. I was one of the very few. I gave it a great review. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm not sure that it's, it's necessarily the greatest film of all time, but I, I, it, was, it was certainly one that I enjoyed. The favorite is wonderful. It's a huge amount of fun. Dearest Queen, how goes the kingdom? You just look at me. Stop it! I am the queen, but you are mad. <laughs> You look like a badger. I've sent for some lobsters. I thought we could brace them and then eat them. Is there cake? Let's shoot something. I should have you stripped and whipped. I'm waiting. We want something dramatic. Your Majesty. I'd like to enjoy the music now. Madness. Sometimes a lady likes to have some fun. Uh, something like Vice is coming up, which is dividing audiences. Um, myself and other British friends have really enjoyed it because it's, it's wacky and crazy. It's about the American Vice President Dick Cheney. I can handle the more mundane jobs, overseeing bureaucracy, military, energy, and uh, foreign policy. Yeah, right. I like that. American critics and American audiences, by contrast, I think it's a little more difficult for them to have so much fun poked to their politicians. So that's dividing people at the moment. Um, I, think, I think out of all the films this year, I've certainly enjoyed a lot of the blockbusters, which, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying as a critic, but um, I think they've been strong and I think they've raised their game. Must unite and organize to fight racism. Are you down for the liberation of black people? Power to the people. All power to all the people. All power to all the people. It's right system. For you, it's a crusade. For me, it's a job. You're Jewish. That hatred, doesn't that piss you off? You're taking this Jew lie detector test. Why are you acting like you ain't got skin in the game? Sure. Um, but I would like to see a few more interesting, strong films being made in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So let's wait for February the 10th to find out who's going to get the big prize. Thank you so yes. much for and joining the Oscar us nominations. today. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. While it may be one of the world's youngest art collections, it happens to contain the most important pieces of Dutch art in the world. After its debut at Paris's Lour Museum in 2017, the Leiden Collection then made its way to the National Museum of China in Beijing. And now the Russian city of St. Petersburg is hosting this extraordinary exhibit. The world's largest private collection of Northern Renaissance art is on display at the Hermitage. Named after Rembrandt's hometown, the Leiden collection is made up of eight paintings, most by the Dutch artist, and all on display in Russia for the first time. The collection was started by Dr. Thomas S. Kaplan in 2003 and has since grown with collectors selling off paintings as a way of weathering the 2008 financial crisis. And today, this assemblage of Dutch Golden Age paintings rivals that of many national museums. The Leiden collection is very young. They collected it all around the world. About 20 years ago, no one could ever think that just in 15 years, someone could so easily collect old artworks of such scale, of such significance. 
but they succeeded. These are the first steps Rembrandt took in painting. He was only 18 and doing an apprenticeship, but he managed to reflect a wide range of emotions using just paint and palette. The painting, Unconscious Patient, Allegory of Smell, for many years was believed to be lost. But in 2015, it unexpectedly appeared at a small auction in New Jersey. Its owners thought the 19th century image wasn't a significant work and listed the asking price at $800. In the end, it sold for more than one million. This is a young master who is looking for his own unique style. This picture is almost like a sketch to the small size. It is uncomplicated, there is lightness to it, and it is not very detailed. In addition, one must always remember that the artists of that time, the whole process of work fell on them. They could not buy a tube of paint. Pigments and oil were sold separately. The artist further mixed paints and ground minerals into powder. The color would change the more it was ground. He had to think about the color, the minerals, and create all this in his head. Minerva, painted in 1635, is one of Rembrandt's most exciting works. Known as the goddess of science, art, and military affairs, she was often portrayed as a kind of archetypal nymph. But refusing to play to stereotypes, Rembrandt painted her with the features of a real woman. Historians say the painting was inspired by his wife, Saskia. It's a prime example of the artist's masterful ability to reflect the depth of the soul in a portrait. The 17th century was the heyday of the Kunstkamera, the cabinet of curiosities from the exotic Far East. All the items in this picture are from Rembrandt's personal collection. There are very expensive clothes, brocade, gold, expensive old books and helmets. Rembrandt was very fond of collecting items that he used in his paintings. But two of the Leiden collection's most significant pieces are not by Rembrandt. The first is a young woman seated at the Virginal by Jan Vermeer, the only canvas of the Dutch master that is privately owned. Drawn on the same canvas as the famous lace maker, which is on display at the Louvre, it is an example of the tradition of Dutch artists' desire to the charm of everyday home life and the beauty of a woman's inner world. But there is a mystery behind how this yellow shawl came to be. Added after the fact, it happens to be hiding a graceful dress underneath it. Everything is illuminated with such a steady light that is emphasized by the light from the window. Very finely done in expensive paint. There is an assumption that it has been repainted, but the question is, who made it? Whether Vermeer himself or someone later. In the history of painting, it often happens that the owners of paintings in the 18th and 19th centuries were very free to handle the paintings that they own. They could order artists to add something, repaint or change the size. The second work is a drawing by Italian Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci. Believed to be a study, an early sketch done in preparation for a larger painting, it shows a head of a bear, which da Vinci likely saw in a zoo or a wandering circus. It's considered a prototype for the picture Lady with an Norman, with da Vinci transforming the bear into a stoat, but with a more elongated muzzle. After the exhibition ends in January, it will be transported from Russia to the United Arab Emirates, where it will go on display at the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Thanks for joining us, and if you're looking for more of Showcase's coverage of the global art scene, you can find it on our YouTube channel. But before we say goodbye, let's pay a visit to Helsinki, where a luminous event is helping combat the city's short number of daylight hours and long, dark nights. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.